Hey, Staten Island. This is HealthWish, a conversation about the state of healthcare in the fabulous fifth borough. Our aim is to raise issues, raise awareness, and raise health. Because when we raise health, we raise everyone. In today's episode, HealthWish is joined by two heavyweights in the healthcare space. Staten Island University Hospital Executive Director, Dr. Brahim Ardolik, and Staten Island Borough President, the Honorable James Otto. Give it a listen. Hello, I'm Brahim Ardolik. I'm the Executive Director of Staten Island University Hospital. And I'm sitting here with a true friend to Staten Island University Hospital and to every Staten Islander, our own borough president, James Otto. How are you? Welcome. We meet again, Doc. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Doc. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is a long time in the making, and I'm really happy to be involved with actually getting together and actually just talking about all the amazing things that you've done. And, um, you know, just wanted to, to really kind of get to know you a little bit more and specifically in relation to health. So. I'm actually curious. You've always been very well read and very interested in health. Where'd that come from? 1981, I'm 105 pounds and I'm on the wrestling team and I'm getting my booty beaten in every gym in in Staten Island and I'm going to wrestling. I was a freshman going up against seniors and juniors and at the end of the season, I'm heading out to wrestling camp. It's really the first time I'm going to be away from home and my father was on the floor of the bathroom uh, crying out in pain. And that leads eventually to, as I'm leaving, uh, him having his right kidney uh, removed. And my father was uh, was a rock. He was this workaholic. He was a motorman who drove trains all around New York City. And he had four sons and a wife, and um, he had to make that, that salary work. And so he was a workaholic, but he was constantly ill. He had all kinds of chronic diseases, ultimately having his right leg removed at Staten Island University Hospital, his right leg below the knee. And I grew up in that atmosphere, and I watched my mom be a caretaker. I watched what he went through as a as a as a man, and and uh, how they took bit by bit of him. And then I watched what it did to my mom and the family, and. I knew that the difference between me and my father in the gene pool was I didn't smoke um, and I didn't have the diet he had. And it just, it just became part of what I cared about. And then I started working for John Fusco, who was on the health committee in the city council. Then I got elected to the city council and I teamed up with this amazing lady by the name of Chris Quinn, who was the health chair. And it just seemed to be part of my identity. And when I got in elective office, I knew that was a role I wanted to play and I wanted to hopefully in some small way have other Staten Island families not go th- through that experience growing up as a kid in, in that climate. Listen, since you said it, thank you for the opportunity to take care of your dad. It's truly a privilege to be able to take care of people's parents. Yeah. It's not fun to get older, and it's not fun to watch your parents get older, but thank you for that opportunity. Yeah, you know, I, I, I kind of jumped into that story, but I really should start by, by saying that I, I'm, I'm so grateful to be here because it gives me another platform to say what I've said to you privately, and say what I've, I've said publicly, and And that is, we are so fortunate to have you at the helm of this hospital. Uh, You know, coming out of this pandemic, that 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 point was driven home time and time again. How many times we were on the call? Uh, I I've studied leaders and I've studied leadership. You are, in fact, a great leader. Uh, And and the importance of Staten Island University Hospital to this borough. You know, I felt multiple times with my father. And then my mom decided she wanted to get into the act a couple of times, and and you guys took care of it. But that last experience with my dad, being told by one of your skilled surgeons that it's counterintuitive, but time is tissue. So let's take our time. And my father was in this coma-like state. His toes were black, and it was preach patience so that we could define between good tissue and bad tissue. And then on a dime, it became literally a life over limb, and the decision was made. And, and that was devastating. That was devastating to, to all of us. And, you know, uh, my dad went on, I think that was 2002, my dad went on to live another 10 years. And the importance of health care and having a facility like yours and having good leadership was just brought home in Technicolor. So I'm just grateful to be here and, and remind Staten Island how fortunate we are to have you at the helm. Thank you. I, I think it's been... Uh one of the reasons we wanted to do these and uh, to really sit with you is because of the partnership and how amazing 
what we were able to do together was. Uh, and honestly, I, I think I wanted to talk a little bit about leadership specifically relating to COVID. I mean, it's hard to kind of, in this day and age, kind of even start having this conversation without at least touching upon it. You actually took some fairly unpopular positions and some really difficult time in regards to vaccination and everything else and did it with passion and verve and in a way where you were really trying to protect your community. And I just wanted to kind of just touch upon vaccinations and kind of in this environment to be so forward about that when it wasn't always the easiest thing to do. I just kind of wanted you to touch upon that. Yeah, well, when, you, when you're on the phone with a, the leader of the institution like SIUH or even your counterpart at, at Rumsey on a daily basis and you're giving us updates on how close the system, you know, how, how far the system is being stretched, what the, the brave staff that you have, what they were going through on a daily basis, the relentlessness of the of the the death and having to deal with that, I mean that, that's really powerful. And so, you know, I'm supposed to balance lots of interests. And I have to tell you, you're right. I I, I was a big defender of the restaurant industry, and I've lost some friendships, and I. I I was criticized in certain circles because I wasn't more aggressive in indoor dining, and, and I had to balance that against things I heard from, from you and things that I, 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 I knew were happening inside your hospital and across Staten Island. And you, you, you add it all together and you try to make an educated decision. And so, I mean, the stories that you told, uh, the stories that I heard, what your staff endured, what your leadership team endured, what Staten Islanders were enduring, it just seemed like on balance, this is what we needed to do. And, you know, we, we continue to get the message out, you know, get vaccinated. Uh, we kidded around off camera that, you know, I got vaccinated, I'm, I'm taking it out, you know, I'm kicking the tires and I'm, I'm going to get my money's worth. This is why we got vaccinated to, to get back to some normalcy. And it's, and I'm trying to do that, but be smart. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I, I get the criticism and I understand that people's livelihoods were at stake, but I really wish I could have gotten all of Staten Island on some of those calls that we had and to hear the professionalism, the passion, the concern, the, the extraordinary steps that you and, and your team went through so that they had a fuller understanding of why we were making some of the decisions we were at Borough Hall. You know, it's interesting because it goes along with where we are right now and how correct some of those positions actually were at the time. You know, we've pretty much been, been between 10 and 20 COVID patients uh, in the building now for the last several weeks. And when you look at it, they all have two things in common. Most of them had COVID before and none of them are vaccinated. So when you look at what's going on with variants and everything else, while I can't definitively tell you that all the people on Staten Island in the hospitals have one of these variants and probably Delta if they're young, um, I can pretty much tell you that's likely the case because that seems to be who's in there right now. And it, you know, it is, a, it is a shame that if we had gotten everybody to this point now, we probably wouldn't be dealing with this. You know, and I've, I used to say to people, you know, let's do this to get all, past this all together. My position has changed a little bit. Now I say to people, don't get vaccinated for me. Don't get vaccinated for the greater good. Get vaccinated because you're protecting yourself. Hmm. Get vaccinated by protecting your family because that's the reality of where we are right now. I think there are a lot of Staten Islanders who had some, you know, mild case or more severe case of COVID who believe that they are now they have the antibodies and they're fully wow. protected. And you've actually said to me in this in this last week or so about how the immunization is actually sh stronger against the the variant. One of the first viruses in history that, for whatever reason. For whatever reason, the, the, immun the, the immunization is more, gives you more resistance than actually having the Amazing. disease. No one really knows why, uh, but it is one of those weird facts about COVID, and it's a real thing. I tell you, Doc, of, of all the, the, the conversations we had in, in, uh, during, during the pandemic, and, and so much of it is a blur, but one of, the, one of the conversations that sticks out in my mind is one of the first ones when I think it was like when the first weekend where we realized we were up against it and you said and i called you and and you said jim it's eerily quiet and it was the first sign that folks who had chest pains or some other ailment weren't going to the hospital and you said like this is going to be a problem down the line and it was and it was yeah Oof. yeah it's luckily the people are coming back now and all that care returned but there sadly were a whole bunch of people who died at home during that period without coming to a hospital or got real sick and caused themselves damage to their lungs and their hearts and, their, uh, and they didn't come in. It's one of the saddest things about this is all the people who could have been cared for 
who weren't because they were afraid. And it's uh, it's one of the sad things, one of the legacies of 2020 that we're going to probably live for a long time and hopefully not see again in our lifetimes. Yeah, I just, you know, I, I watched how politics or sort of my business bled into your business and people were making decisions of, for themselves and their families with a, in my estimation, sort of an, uh, an overreach of the, the sort of the political belief. And this is an instance where, you know, I, I firmly believe, which has been a mantra since we've gotten to Burr Hall, and let, let science be your North Star and, and listen to the health experts, don't listen to the politicos. But I think that's a, an ongoing conversation. So a couple of cool health things not related to COVID that I wanted to make sure that we touched upon because I don't think people, at least people at SIUH, for a fact, I could tell you, not all of them. And I think a lot of the people on Staten Island don't know all the different health care issues that you truly have helped with. So I just wanted to kind of touch upon a couple of them. Everyone knows that we're putting a lot of money into building a new cancer center. Happy to report that uh, in pretty much 18 months, our brand new comprehensive cancer center with a PEDS area will be open. But you've been working on breast cancer screening for a long time. Tell us about that. Yeah, early on in my council tenure, Staten Island had the longest wait times for mammography, the worst in the city. And again, my, my relationship with Chris Quinn, uh, who was the health chair at the time, or on the health committee at the time, and then eventually the health chair. Uh, and, you know, there, yet again, Staten Island having sort of the, the worst of all worlds. There was a woman who we, we befriended, uh, Agnes Akendo. And Agnes was a runner. And I think her, stories, her story sort of typifies the, that time. She, she goes to, to get a mammography, and she's told a date months and months in advance. And she's running one day, I think down Victory Boulevard, and she sees a sign for no-weight mammography. And she makes an appointment. And at that appointment, she gets a mammography. She gets diagnosed with breast cancer and has her surgery a month ahead of her original mammography appointment. And there were lots of women on Staten Island who waited, lots of women who were deterred from getting a mammography by the wait. And, you know, Lord only knows what those health outcomes were because of that. And so we, we you know, went on a mission, Chris Quinn and I and others, to, to cut those times, worked with SIUH, Dr. Carolyn Rea, who was a, a huge figure at, at SIUH in this arena, and went out, got some funding for digital mammography machines, and and fought hard to get those wait times down through the collaborations with SIUH and others. You know, I, I've, I've long since blurred the line, and, and it's sort of given me my best moments in my profession and my worst moments. I've blurred the lines between business and personal. To me, everything is personal, and that was really personal. And I'm proud of the fact that, you know, we, we played a role in, in bringing those wait times down. And you'll be happy to hear that the goal is to bring it down even further. We're actually looking at additional mammography uh, screening time. We're looking at opening a women's center on the West Shore as well so that we can actually continue to increase the amount of capacity for women to get that vital screening. Because the reality is, you know, and I just went through it with one of my family members, for certain kinds of cancer, the only way to really know is if you actually go do the screening test. Yeah. And if you don't, you're not going to know until you know you get come in with a stage three or a stage four, and that's the real issue. We we did some amazing PSAs at, since we were at Borough Hall with four truly wonderful women who went through it just to encourage Staten Islanders to to get mammography. And I don't know if the word is ironically uh, enough. You know, shortly thereafter, two really special people to me on our Borough Bar Hall family were touched by it, and. Um, you know, you think you're, you think you're uh, maybe a little bit of a tough guy and then your wife comes home and she says that she's got something suspicious or you have a family member from your work family actually get diagnosed with it and it just, it is a gut punch and a half and um, it puts everything into perspective. So when you got a little platform like we have at Borough Hall or when I was in the council, you got to use it for real things. and. There's nothing, I think, more real than that, uh, certainly when you get that phone call. So, we're, you know, we're really proud of all the work that we've done in the council at Borough Hall on this front because everything else in the world that is so important up until that news comes becomes so unimportant, unimportant when that news uh, lands at home. And so, you know, it's, it's been some of the proudest work we've done and, and certainly the most important work that we've done. 
Speaking of critical work and blurring the lines, uh, let me listen. Let me say we were finally able to reopen cardiac rehab on Staten Island fairly recently after having to close it for COVID because you can imagine what cardiac rehab is like. No masks. There's people huffing and puffing on treadmills. Not the most ideal situation in a COVID environment. We were finally able to get that reopened. But just to take it back, um, without your kind of intervention, cardiac rehab never happens on Staten Island, and not doesn't happen at SIUH doesn't happen on Staten Island. You know, and between that and a lot of the work that you've done with your barbershop uh, programs, you've really been able to impact some of the sickest people and actually extend their lives. So I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. So, so the cardiac rehab is one of my favorites because uh, it goes back to my days as a young staff working for John Fusco, who was my mentor. He started something called the Civic Roundtable, where he'd bring all the civic leaders uh, to, to the office at 94 Lincoln Avenue, all in the same room. and. He would force commissioners from the Dinkins administration to come to Staten Island, and, 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 and we branched it out to senior roundtables. And then when I got in the city council, we did health roundtables. And when we got to Borough Hall, we continued that. And cardiac rehab comes from at the end of a roundtable we were doing at Borough Hall on cardiac health, someone mentions the fact that there are no cardiac rehabs on Staten Island anymore. And then the conversation moved on and I said, wait a second, can we go back to that? Why is that? And then I heard, you know, it, 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 it costs a lot of money. And that started us on this mission. And the funny story is, this is your, one of your predecessors was, so we bring SIUH and, and Rumsey back to a meeting at, at the Hilton and it was a follow-up meeting. And, we weren't where we needed to be. And I remember like losing my, my cool a little bit and saying like, guys, like if you don't want to do it, just let me know. And I used some salty language and said, I, you know, I kind of expected this from city agencies, not my partners. And, and that got it moving. And to see what, you know, what you've done at the South Campus with that and to see Staten Islanders when we visited with you, you know, it just, it, it makes me feel great that we have that service on Staten Island. We don't have to have Staten Island either going off island or worse still, not engaging that because you and, and your colleagues talk about how effective and important it is. The other thing, the, the barbershop is just, it's so bizarre and it's just a, a testament to reading. I'm reading a book, not about health and wellness, it's a book called Who, Who Can You Trust, about trust, and it talks about uh, the Tuskegee experiment that we've heard about a lot since COVID. I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know what it was. And it talks about this guy, Dr. Jeffrey Ravenel, who uses barbershops. And it talks about a TED Talk that he did. And go on the internet, God bless the internet, watch the TED Talk and like, this is amazing. And where is this guy? Well, he's in New York. Let's find him. And we reached out to Dr. Ravenel and we brought him in and he's just an amazing human being. Just a humble, soft-spoken, just a great guy. And, it took us a little while, but we have it up and running, and we work with Chazzy, and, and we're going to expand it real soon. And it's a, it's a wonderful program where you reach men of color. You reach them at a place where they're comfortable, and, and it's a barbershop, and you can talk to them about hypertension, the silent killer. Yeah, you know, on both sides of that, you know, being having an honest conversation with people in a situation where they're actually comfortable is really kind of the key to getting them to understand where this is going. Hypertension and diabetes, both of them, you know, if you let that go for a certain period of time, it only leads to one place, but it, it's hard to see. You know, and on the cardiac rehab side, you know, it's interesting. We all have met that person who goes and gets their life saved only to return home and essentially not be able to do much. So they, they linger like that for another year or 18 months and they eventually wind up dying, you know. Cardiac rehab actually takes that person and think about what's a little screwed up with healthcare in our society. This was something that's hard to do, and this is something that's hard to put together, and yet it takes that person and puts them back on their feet. So instead of sitting on their couch and watching this, they're actually walking around Clove Lakes Park, and they're actually interacting with their grandkids, and they're throwing, they're throwing balls around. And that's kind of the key of why that's so incredibly important. It's not enough to just survive. Yeah. And I think that's where we kind of have to get people. The key is to get your life back, not to survive. Yeah, you, you guys did a great job of educating me about the, the incidence of depression related to cardiac yeah. events. And now they're in, a, they're in a supervised location with other folks. There's a little bit more, I guess, confidence that 
if God forbid something happens or they have that fear, they're, they're good, talented people around them, but they're with other individuals. And again, you, everything you kind of relate to your own family. You know, my late Uncle Vince, who was a, a challenge and a half, he had an opinion about everything. He, um, he used it and he, he praised it. I mean, he was a hard judge, judge. He was, you know, he was the judge in the Olympics who, who was the outlier. 7.0. Yeah, boop. Yeah. yeah, and that was being generous <laughs> with Uncle Vince. But he praised it, and he was in a group of folks, and, they, and there were sort of friendships that lasted beyond it. And I, I remember being in the, in the room of our hall and asking, you know, you all, like, well, wait a second, Do, is it effective? Does it work? And, and you're like, oh, yeah. All right, well, let's figure out a way. And what you guys have done, again, in the, in the South Campus is just, it's, uh, it's just it's a wonderful thing to see. Yeah, the South Campus is really kind of going through a revitalization, and that's one of the reasons we were so excited to finally be able to reopen it once all the guidelines kind of got back and we can actually get that program going. It was really nice walking up to some of the staff who'd been working there and saying, hey, we're getting this started again, and to kind of see the looks on their faces, it was really kind of a blessing to kind of have the opportunity to see that. And I can't wait to actually, you know, again, get to our thousandth, two thousandth wow. patients because you truly affect people's lives in those kind of programs. I walked out of there when we did a tour after it was up and running. You guys took us on a tour, and I, I walked out of there. Just that's what allows you to deal with the the folks on social media who call you a bum and call you all kinds of names, and you question your own sanity why you would ever do this business. You see that, and you know that, that you and your team, in a collaboration with other good folks, can actually impact people's lives in a in a, in a meaningful way, and that's that's why you should be in this business. And that's where we'll pick up next time as the conversation turns to job creation. HealthWish wishes to thank our very special guests, James S. Otto, Borough President of Staten Island, and Dr. Brahim Ardolik, Executive Director of Staten Island University Hospital. We're very interested in your HealthWish. Contact us at healthwish at northwell.edu. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon.